you. Uh, actually, Nova means new. There are two major universities in Lisbon, where I come from. A older one, it is called the University of Lisbon, <coughs> uh, and the new University of Lisbon, which is dates from the late uh, 70s of the 20th century. Uh, well, I would like to thank the Center of Urban History, and especially Foden and Oksana, for having me here. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a teacher in the history department, and I work mainly with political history and social history, Portuguese and also Latin American and European history. And uh, more recently, I'm starting to be interested in, the, in humor studies. And I, I'm, I'm starting to be interested in uses, in political and social uses of humor. So I, I start developing develop, uh, a project about uh, editorial cartoons, satirical press, and how they represent uh, several issues in the political agenda in, the, in Europe in 19th and 20th centuries. So uh, humor is a too serious matter to be left alone to humor to humorists. As a form of communication, it is a language that can be expressed orally, written, or visually through the cartoon and caricature, among other forms. Regardless of its support, humor is assumed uh, as a conceptualization of reality, even though it is presented through coded expressions. Humor can be transgressive, subversive, and mocking. Transgressive because it presents itself against the norm. Subversive because it puts the norm in question and questions it in a disturbing way. And mocking because it must always be provocative. Cartoon and caricatures integrates the art of contesting and breaking the rules of observation of social and political reality, not so much because of who or what is represented, but because of the way that re representation takes on the eyes of those who interpret it and decode it. Thus, visual satire distinguishes itself as one of the most widespread artistic genres from the late 18th century onwards, because at the time it would be the first and often the only visual way to record contemporary events. Uh, being produced to give a quick response to society's reactions to various political and social issues. It aims, uh, its aims was not to provide an accurate reading mm. of the facts represented, but rather to provoke a critical reflection on them among the public, especially because artists should be sensitive to variations and nuances in the consumer's opinions about the image and later the satirical press. For a long time, research on topics related to caricature and cartoons has come mainly from the fields of art history, media studies, cultural studies, or literature derivatives. But researchers who made it an empirical object with autonomy are unanimous in considering that graphic satire reveals or distorts the reality uh, that it purposes to portray according to a defined and compromised the ideological purpose. Therefore, it is important to rescue the study of caricature and cartoon from these discursive, discursive universes and to give it centrality in the field of political history. From the point of view of the mythology employed, I'm interested in caricatures and cartoons as a language, as a problem, as an object of study endowed with epistemological autonomy and not so much to analyze images as an illustration. But what do we see when we look at a cartoon or a caricature? How important is the knowledge about the context of produc production of satirical images? This works approaches more a perspective of the historian, even of the social or political historian, and less of the art historian. Political cartoons do not escape the plurality of interpretations. They are played in a triangular relationship between a cartoonist who tells a story, a target object, 
uh, of the drawing, a reader who interprets and judges. We must then ask the triple question of who draws, what target, who judges. The output of my uh, current research project, I'm writing a, a very ambitious history of editorial cartoons in Europe. Well, I started by Portugal, and then I started comparing, comparing Portugal and Spain, and then I go, uh, I go from there, uh, which I intend to discuss, compares the evolution of visual satire in the authoritarian regimes of Portugal and Spain uh, between 1933 and 1975, debating the contribution of the visual turn to this specific field of history, uh, looking at differences and similarities between governments, we seek to show how the Portuguese new state and spe Spanish Francoism use satirical press to consolidate themselves as political regimes, and what kind of visual sat satire uh, the Iberian dictators allow in their countries in the end, we seek to understand if it is possible to study graphic humor in authoritarian and non-liberal regimes by avoiding the normalization of their political discourses. To understand what caricatures and cartoons as historical sources and documents can teach us about relevant political events and personalities and whether it is possible to extend this methodology to other European dictatorships during the 20th century. Well, the relationship between authoritarian regimes and humor was always been one of a conflict. The comic, as an instrument of criticism and social and political satire, but also as a disconstruction of reality, was not be tolerated in environments where the extant ideology could not support the condemnation of government's practices by a considerable portion of the population. When you tell a joke, it is intended to produce immediate effects. Not that it makes you laugh or smile 10 years later. To study the history of humor, and in this particular case, the graphic humor, it is always necessary to take into account the context of the production of these images. Some words then about the Portuguese political uh, the context of the first decades of the 20th century to better understand who Salazar is and how he appears in politics. Uh, shortly after the revolution that occurred in 1926, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar would be called by the military to exercise the finance ministry in the new government. He came from Coimbra, where he taught at the university. Coimbra is one of the most ancient universities in Europe, as you all know, and he has a very big reputation as a rigorous professor, a reputation considered essentially for the fi financial consolidation of public accounts. Uh, it should be noted that although it is earlier, the problem of the chronicle deficiency of the Portuguese state was greatly aggravated by the effects of the cons consequences of the First World War. Less than a decade after the end of the conflict, this was one of the most major blockages after affecting the Republican regime, which opened in 1910. So we have this first republic between 1910 and 1926. In, a, in, a, in addition, endemic political instabil instability in 14, these 16 years, we have 45 governments and seven presidents of the republic and where political and social violence also prevailed. In May 1926, a group of soldiers, like I said before, rebelled against the state of affairs and promote uh, a coup from, from the north of Portugal, a revolution that would put the end to this liberal republican regime. The young finance minister, who came from a family of small rural, rural owners in the central zone of the country, would be one of the fundamental pieces of new phase that opening the Portuguese politics from now on. Uh, as, the cons as the conditions that Salazar deemed necessary for the performance of his duties were not met by then, the professor of Quimbra resigned after two weeks in Lisbon and he returned to the university. 
He will return afterwards, after two years, in 1928, to begin then permanent, permanently a successful reform of national public finances. From then on, Salazar, although not formally the head of the government, became the strong man of the executive. All expenditures and their authorizations from any ministry would have to pass through his approval, while at the same time initiating a very tight control of public expenditure. The financial question was solved with this step. Political stability would be consolidated, consolidated with the definitive closure of the parliament and with this and, uh, and the end of the party system, uh, still in 1936. Salazar would soon arrive at the presidency of the Council of Ministers, inaugurating with the promulgation in 1933 of a new constitution that changed the political paradigm of the Portuguese, of, the, of Portugal, the new state. Uh, that would survive and would last until 1974. The new regime was markedly anti-parliamentary, anti-communist, and non-liberal. Supported by social doctrine of the church, Salazarism, and where uh, we are not going to discuss here if it was a fascist regime or a very strong authoritarian, authoritarian conservative nationalist, nationalist one, uh, Salazarism was characterized by the affirmation of Catholicism in religious matters, racism in uh, racist colonization in his relation with, to the empire, corporatism in economic terms. The parliament would reopen with two chambers, an election uh, uh, and elections to the chamber of deputies were allowed, although only candidates from the legalized single party were admitted. All of the Republican parties forced, uh, all of the Republican parties uh, was persecuted and abolished, especially the Communist Party. The second chamber in Parliament, the Corporate Chamber, uh, would have only advisory uh, functions. The press came under control by censorship, depends on, dependent on the Ministry of Interior while the good political order depends on the action of political police uh, repre with repressive instruments that would remain active through the regime until 1974. The satirical press, whose origins in Portugal date back to the mid-19th century and which had served as a critical and uncomf <coughs> uncomfortable voice against political power during the con constitutional monarchy between 1874 1910 and the republic and the republic the first republic like i said 1910 1936 would be one of the main targets of persecution directly by the new regime and the free and independent media and under, under the censorship implemented soon after the arrival to power by Salazar the first passage of Oliveira Salazar by, by the political scene did not catch attention of the satirical press. This branch uh, of journalism lived in 1926, a very positive phase. Two weeks before the coup, one of the most important Portuguese 20th century caricature periodicals, the Sempre Fish, we can translate it as always cool, uh, Uh, appear in that, in that period. Shortly after the revolution that occurred in 1926, Antonio Oliveira Salazar would be called by the military, like I said, to exercise the finance ministry in this new government. Uh, well, it should be noticed that uh, the, the political satirical press during this phase uh, was very highly repressed. The artists that publish and draw for this press, they were persecuted. And then the journals, that the, the magazines, the journals that were published by them, they, they, they were not suppressed, but they transformed, they adapt these new circumstances. Here uh, on your uh, left, uh, we have the Sempre Fish, the Always Cool. And on the right, we have an exemplar of the Ridicules, os Ridicules. Uh, which are probably the two biggest and main 
journals that were still published and they were never interrupted during this uh, authoritarian regime uh, phase until 74. Even though, what I'm saying is, even though the satirical press and the artists are repressed, the, the newspapers uh, deal with censorship, they adapt to this, to this new environment, and they still, uh, they still were published in this, in this context. Well, the relationship between authoritarian regimes and humor has always been one of the conflicts, like I said. Uh, the, the comic as an instrument of criticism, social and political satire, and also the, this construction of reality. Uh, in, in this case, they, 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 they like, I, like I said, they, 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 they change the focus and they don't directly attack the regime. Uh, in, in this period, the, this political uh, satirical press, they turn more to uh, social issues, to custom issues, and less to political issues. That's what we can call a, a survival strategy of this satirical press. Some of the people that draw in this press uh, in this moment, especially in the, in the 30s, before the World War, the Second World War, some of them, they were, they were, they were known communists, uh, uh, members of the Communist Party, which is an illegalized party in Portugal, but they made a more or less like a compromise with the political powers, uh, a non-written compromise in the sense that they uh, uh, don't draw directly political issues and they draw their attention more to social and custom issues. So they, they, still, uh, they, still, they, still, uh, they still publish, they still draw, and it's very striking 50, 70 years afterwards, we, we saw some drawings of these that now we know that uh, communist members, communist drawers, communist artists, and they, they were not very uh, uh, strongly politically engaged in this phase. And for us, it's kind of striking uh, how they abandon their satirical role to adapt to, this, uh, to these circumstances. Well. Uh, in 1926, a new highly restrictive press law was published. Uh, like I said, the, 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 the journals were not, uh, they were not, uh, they were not disappear in this period, uh, but they start to changing their artistic uh, agenda. Uh, Salazar begins to appear in the pages of the humoristic press only in 1927, uh, still in a very, uh, in a very uh, innocuous way, since the future dictator is not yet well known of the general public and holds no public office for the time being. His image is associated, in this case, with an incident with the tri Tribunal of Commerce. This is what the caption here says. This is the former finance, finance ministry, ministry, and uh, the newspaper is the always cool, the Sempre Fish, the newspaper that I mentioned before. From the moment he became a permanent member of the government, Salazar became also a synonym of control spending and uh, in, and an iron fist with taxpayers. In the ridicules, uh, this caricature showed the ministry cutting the hair of a donkey to make it sherry, an expression that in Portuguese also means to censor or to rob someone. This expression, make the tas tushkia, it means in the popular language that someone is being robbed. The people here that is being robbed is is the taxpayer. 
So Salazar is taking care of the donkey, but in other words, is basically taking care of the taxpayer. Well, now in this uh, in this uh, caricature, he was uh, in, in his portrait as the virtuoso a musician virtuoso. Uh, you can you cannot see from there. This is the treasure. Okay, this is the expenditure expenditures here, revenues here, and uh, here we can have the. Uh, music instrument, and here you can see the government, the Diario do Governo, it means the official journal of the government. And you, ca you can see banknotes coming out of the music instrument. Here you can always uh, see written taxpayer. So Salazar is still the virtuoso that is taking notes, literally not musical notes, but bank notes from the taxpayer. This is another curious image of Salazar, and probably uh, soon after it would be impossible to see uh, in the press. Now is uh, this this this, this uh, issue is published in the 23rd of December, 1931, so just before Christmas. So Salazar is the, 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 the Christ rib that is about, to, is about to born. And here we can see the caption, the, the morning, the, the, the birth of the Redemptor. So he's again, is going to redeem the country uh, by controlling finances, which is here very well uh, expressed. This is the image that I, I would like to say, a very curious image, and probably one of the last critical images of Salazar in 1932. His portrait, along with uh, other cabinet ministers, but his portrait as Louis, Louis XIV, the French king, and with the caption, l'état c'est moi. So it's a very strong critic, uh, critique on Salazar and probably one of the last uh, direct uh, critics that the, this satirical press made to the dictator. Because in 1933, we have the new constitution, the new state, and Salazar took over the government. And then the images of Salazar, they change a bit in the satirical press. Here he is a nun taking care of children, uh, also in the always school. Here it's a very interesting image. Salazar is portrait as the sun. Is uh, is light. He reflects on the this character, which represent the Portuguese people, and the caption said a dream, but maybe not a dream. So the Portuguese people is dreaming with Salazar and Salazar is shredding the light uh, through the people again. So uh, this is a very, a very interesting image uh, uh, illustrating an interview of the Noticias. Noticias it's a very popular journal in Portugal by then. It's still published today and it's a very uh, pro-government journal uh, at, at the time. In 1933, uh, when this, uh, with this, uh, with this caricature was published, Salazar gave a several set of interviews to this newspaper, and that's what is, uh, what is uh, joking around in this, in this caricature. Now, Salazar dressed as a common man uh, on a horse is again, uh, how do you say, uh, spitting, putting uh, the, the bull, but the bull is the treasure and the treasure is uh, spreading coins again. And it's another way of saying 
that Salazar is still on control of things, is still on control of uh, contributions and taxes. Actually, this is what the caption here says. And again, 1933, uh, Salazar, very well dressed, in a comparative perspective with a common man, uh, to make the difference okay, between the Portuguese political elite and the common man, and this, 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 uh, this caricature uh, shows uh, these differences between uh, who is in charge and who have to obey to this, to this, in, in this context. Again, in 1939, again Salazar. Uh, it, I mean, it's the same relationship between Salazar and the uh, control of public finances. And now, in sp again. Uh, in, in 1949, uh, Salazar was much less draw in the newspaper. He appeared much less, like I said before. Caricaturists, uh, I'm going to stop in five. Uh, caricaturists uh, stopped drawing Salazar like this, and uh, he, occur, he, he, he appears only very sporadically in the in the in the in the press. Now he's, in 1949, he's here with the Spanish <coughs> dictator, Francisco Franco, uh, says, uh, the caption is very, is very interesting because it says, uh, well, in this year there was a football match between Portugal and Spain, in Portugal, and it says that the match was disputed with the biggest loyalty and sportsmen. There are no violent players, uh, the, the, the shocks between the, 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 the players were very friendly, and we even this match even has no referee, because no referee is necessary uh, in, this, in this match, because the two captains, Salazar and Franco, understand them, each other very well. So this, this image shows us the very tight connection and very good relation between the two Iberian dictators in the 40s. Actually, after uh, the Spanish Civil War, there was a, a very big proximity, proximity between the two regimes, the Portuguese and, Spani and the Spanish one. And here, uh, Salazar, is only, during his whole life, he only go twice abroad, once Two, two kilometers away from the Portuguese border to meet Salazar, and another way to Seville, which is not very far from the Portuguese border, also to meet Franco. So that means that there was this very, very uh, strong connection between, between these two political men. Well, the time goes on, and before I finish, I would like to show an old Salazar. Now he's back to his own profession. He's still in power. Well, actually, he was in power until 1968. And here he's still in power. Now, the, the, the political press shows Salazar as a professor, as a teacher. He's teaching math. It's the same as saying he's teaching the Portuguese people, represented here, uh, teaching how to deal with their own debts and their own uh, their own uh, ways to make uh, uh, arithmetics. Another meeting between Salazar and Franco in 1950, also represented in the, in the ridicules. The friends are for the occasions, that we, we can read here. And through the end, Salazar never abandoned his role of teacher. Now he's teaching again the Portuguese people, and the Portuguese people saying, written in the, in the board, I pay, you pay, he pays, we pay, you pay, we all pay. That's what mentioned in here. Uh, but the relation is always the same. And some conclusions. Uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, to try to give a short answer 
uh, to the initial research questions, we might conclude that satirical press was used to consolidate the authoritarian Salazar's political regime. Humor is not an action of non-negotiable transgression. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, the reason for this is his reason for being. The humor act breaks the mirror of social conventions, breaks down well-meaning judgments, and shatters identity stereotypes. So that's why humor is, by definition, excessive. In the images that I just show, if there is any excess, it quickly disappears. Salazar's images was used as a propaganda tool for the new regime. And the other ministries do not appear. They were totally subalternized by the figure as a chief. After the Second World War, and with more vis visibility from the beginning of the 50s onwards, cartoonists stopped drawing Salazar uh, or any other major figure in the, in the Portuguese regime. The regime is no longer under scrutiny of humor. At the beginning, Salazar's technical competence in the area of public finances stands out, saving Portugal from bankruptcy. Then, the political leader gains more visibility. He is at the same time the teacher who rescues the country from illiteracy, the diplomat, diplomat who saved Portugal from war and maintained good relations with Franco, the doctor who heals the many evils of the country, and so on. Satirical press helps the regime to build Salazar's image, not subject to discussion without consequences. The caricatures of Salazar loses some of their initial ambiguity and become obvious, subject to a single benevolent reading. After all, the regime's profile was not open to discussion, neither the dictator paternalistic role is. Satirical press ended up contributing to Salazarism longevity. Public ridicule is what dictators fear most. This was not the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Oops. Yeah. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, now we move on to Bogdan Trofinovic, and the title of his presentation is Wiki Wars, Digital Genres and Memory Models Online, The Arrest of Rafa Mladic as a Case Study. The floor is yours. Thank you, Volkan. And I'm very pleased and grateful that I got the invitation to speak today at this event, uh, and uh, I'll try to be within the planned time frame. So, hello everybody, dobar dan. I come from Serbia. My background is uh, mixed, as you can see. Uh, uh, historian trained in Belgrade, then cultural studies in Warsaw, and uh, for the past 15 years I also built uh, a, a kind of career in library information science working mostly on digital te technologies. That's why I'm also interested in uh, digital history as a discipline per se. So let's start with uh, this uh, presentation. A short overview, and uh, first I want to acknowledge uh, the collaboration with uh, Dr. Marietta Božović from Yale University and Dr. Aleksandr Bošković from Columbia University on a project we had in 2013 in Passau, at the University of Passau. Uh, and the excerpt of this work is my contribution mostly on Wikipedia. Uh, we dealt collaborat collaboratively on uh, Ratko Mladic as a case study uh, because it was quite recent uh, event of his arrest and uh, I'm, I concentrate on this event throughout my presentation. I also will uh, tackle the issue of memory event uh, and of course we'll deal with Wikipedia and uh, as a source for this uh, for this uh, topic, I just want to point out that uh, certain tools we used are basically all listed in the Viant tools as a, uh, a set of digital tools for primarily researchers in humanities, 
which were quite useful for us for at this uh, occasion. So first of all, uh, what is Beaky Wars? Uh, I, I took uh, by myself this definition uh, of Beaky Wars, uh, and it is uh, related to a growing trend in the past decade, certainly, of editors in Wikipedia that uh, confront each other and finally the readers of Wikipedia with their own biased positions, regardless if it is a political, ethnical, religious, or whatever. And uh, with the expansion of Wikipedia's uh, separate pages in many world languages, so we are not talking about Wikipedia in English alone, but in dozens and hundreds of uh, languages, uh, this trend is uh, really going upstream and emerging as a problem. Uh, and I point you all to this uh, very good uh, uh, article, Neutral National Point of View, on comparison of Srebrenica articles across Wikipedia's language versions from 2012. Richard Georges and uh, Nina Sandiarevic are the authors, which were a kind of uh, uh, influential to us in 2013, uh, 12, 2013, yes. Let's say something about Ratko Mladic, uh, because I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with this figure quite prominent in the Balkans. So he was an uh, excellent military, uh, or excellent officer in the Yugoslavian army from uh, 1965 until 1991, after which he became the chief of staff during the war in Bosnia from 1992 to 1996, quite influential, both in military and civilian matters, as well as a charismatic uh, figure because he was quite uh, promoted to media as the main negotiator on the Serbian side. He, uh, this uh, image you can see here is from 1993 at Sarajevo airport when the international uh, community, UN and Na United Nations uh, and all uh, war sides in the war gathered together to negotiate possible peace talks, and he was the representative of the Serbian side, or of the Serbs from Bosnia and Herzegovina. After 1995, in 1996, the International Crimin Criminal Tribunal, Tribunal in, uh, in The Hague declared uh, Ratko Mladic a war criminal and charged him uh, for war crimes in Bosnia during the war, and sought him to come to The Hague to confront uh, these charges, of course, to get to, to, to the trial. He denied and uh, got into some kind of, uh, of exile, but most of the time, from 1996 uh, until 2011, when he was arrested, he was in Serbia under the protection of the Serbian government, and particularly under the protection of the military service. It changed uh, in the in the end of the first decade of the 21st century when he lost his political support and uh, you can see that uh, the Serbian and police traced him uh, on May the 26th, 2011 in the north village of northern Serbia and arrested him. This was the great uh, media event because he was labeled uh, for years before as one of the world's most wanted men and you can see Throughout uh, the uh, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and some other countries, there were protests, uh, huge rallies in support of Ratko Mladic. This is from Banja Luka in, in Bosnia, in Republika Srpska. This uh, news of the event, I would say, so triggered the wide-ranging responses across uh, many genres and platforms, of course. And, uh, we are discussing here about uh, this, as we call it, secondary and ter tertiary rhetorical waves uh, in various forms in digital culture. So we are, we are always talking about digital culture or online, online representation of this event. Of course, everything is connected. This, uh, this news was connected with the memories of the 90s, the wars in Bosnia, atrocities, massacres, genocide, as it was declared by uh, by the court uh, in Srebrenica in 1995, which was the primary uh, uh, primary case against Ratko Mladic. Uh, but uh, it also uh, reflected uh, uh, certain uh, conflicting cultural memories uh, which stem uh, from the 
Second World War, you know, the division between the communists or monarchists, between the Ustashe on the Croatian side, the Chetniks on the Serbian side, etc. And we approach the, the topic as an overall project uh, uh, with this notion of cultural memory event, uh, which uh, triggered all, uh, certain digital rhetoric online uh, and also spurred this development of the new as we call it, the 21st century nationalism, particularly in the Balkans. We had the 90s as the, as the, the, the pinnacle of the nationalism, but as it turns out, without this armed conflict, the nationalism uh, has some, kind, some different form. This time it is uh, online battles, let's call it that way. And we are following Alexander Atkins definition on memory events in this case. I quote this, uh, uh, this uh, article from 2010. So I already mentioned that we have this uh, uh, competing or conflicting cultural models or cultural memories uh, related to Balkan Wars, but uh, as well as much uh, deeper or further into the uh, past of the, of the Balkans, of course. Uh, I want to say that uh, uh, most of Western media and the mainstream of public opinion appears to interact regularly about the topic of the arrest transferring rhetorical comparisons on memory models back and forth across media and online sources. At the same time, a Serbian nationalist counterculture finds space online to cast Marić and so-called Serbian people by met metonymic linkage as a martyr hero in an ongoing anti-imperial struggle. So it, uh, this uh, nationalist uh, movement uh, is uh, uh, seeking to the higher ground of anti-imperial struggle. Such rhetoric in turn garnered, garnered some international sympathy as an anti-Western hegemony mm -hmm. stance. For example, we found expressions of solidarity on many Russians, Russian online forums. The most prominent, direct and expected layers of memory discourse emphasize Majid's associations with Srebrenica and genocide. The next rhetorical move across many online genres is to make implicit or explicit comparisons with Nazi war criminals. So this is the connection because of the genocide, the charges. Relying on emotional associations with World War II and the Holocaust, and thus from the point of view of Western European or NATO forces with the ultimate just war of intervention. Of course, there were another layers of memory which stresses the collapse of international communism, comparing the remnants of the former Yugoslavia with the backwards holdout regimes doomed by global progress towards democratic or neoliberal peace. So our case study uh, uh, was, or in my case, studied, it is Wikipedia mostly, and I will show you comparative readings of uh, Wikipedia in several languages. These are, both, of course, as all Wikipedia articles, multi-authored, multi-edited articles. We saw here uh, uh, the Croatian page. So this is from the Croatian Wikipedia. Uh, just a point that they are using, uh, which is very important uh, in Wikipedia, this image of Ratko Mladic as a, a, a war leader, general, which is, already, is also a negotiator during the 1993 peace talks in Sarajevo, but uh, the, first, uh, art, the first paragraph, which is crucial, uh, I'm also editor uh, in Wikipedia and I know we have to follow uh, certain rules, the first crucial paragraph uh, is uh, uh, giving basic bibliographical information and then immediately switch to his, that he is convicted crime criminal, osuđeni ratni zločinac, after the, the brackets. This is from the Serbian uh, Wikipedia, the same image of Ratko Mladic, and this is the most used image of him uh, uh, related to Wikipedia. But uh, in the first paragraph, there is none about his war crimes. The, the, the text follows his uh, military career, that he was a Serbian general, the chief of staff uh, from 1992 to 1995. And one of the Serbian leaders during the fall, the breakout of Yugoslavia. Uh, during the war in, Bos in Croatia and Bosnia, he was the commander of the uh, key military operations. That's how it would be translated in, in English. Uh, 
So no mention of the war crimes. This is uh, Russian. Uh, yes, this is Russian. And uh, pretty similar. Uh, the, the first part of this first paragraph is almost the same uh, as the Serbian. So we can conclude that the Serbian, the, sorry, the Russian uh, text uh, was maybe the translation of the Serbian text uh, uh, published in Wikipedia. Again, no mention of, uh, uh, yes, no mention about war crimes. At, see, at least in, in part we can see on this slide. This is, uh, I was interested in some other languages, some other discourses, our points of view. This is uh, Spanish uh, uh, Wikipedia. And uh, this one is also, I would say, in line with, uh, with what we heard about the Serbian or the, or the Russian uh, pages. I uh, used this, uh, this uh, example because the, uh, the, the article in uh, Spanish language is uh, esteemed as a, the, of high quality. With the, you can see on the, right hand, on the left hand side where you can choose uh, languages uh, of some article. If it is start, then it is uh, deemed as a high quality article. So I was interested to see how the Spanish Wikipedia treats this issue. And this is the most uh, looked after. This is the English, of course, uh, article. And you can notice the change of the image. Uh, so no more this uh, military, uh, military uh, position. Now Ratko Mladic is uh, on trial at The Hague, as you can see uh, in this uh, title of this, uh, uh, in the description of this image. So immediately there is a, there is a stance uh, uh, against uh, his uh, military role, but more as a role of a uh, charged war criminal. And it is also represented uh, in the first paragraph of this article. I also looked uh, about uh, to see other, other pages or other uh, languages uh, in Wikipedia and notice that this is uh, for major languages, this is the, uh, the, the sole case study that uh, English version is using this a photo, this image of Ratko Mladic, all others, including German, or including Polish, for instance, are using this previous image, this one. Okay. So, uh, for, for the more detailed analysis, I'm uh, focusing on uh, Wikipedia articles on Mladic in Bosnian, Serbian, <coughs> Croatian, English, and Russian, as well as on uh, Wikipedia uh, article written in the so-called Serbo-Croatian part of Wikipedia. Uh, that's, uh, that's, well, that was a project within Wikipedia which wanted to, to be in between the two competing nationalisms, Serbian and Croatian. So it's called Serbo-Croatian, although the Serbo-Croatian does not exist anymore as an official language. It was official language during the socialist Yugoslavia. So I focused on these six let's call them Wikipedias. Even a preliminary reading of the Wikipedia entries on Mladic, Mladic demonstrates significant variations in size, structure, and the usage of external links and references. The Bosnian Wikipedia, for instance, is unexpectedly short and omits all details about Mladic prior to his military career during the 1990s. The Serbian and Russian articles are lengthy, covering Mladic's early life, education, military career, role in the civil wars and subsequent downfall. They inform on the attempted arrest prior to 2011, his actual May 26 arrest, extradition to the ICT, and the trial itself. The Bosnian and Croatian articles focus on recent Balkan history and on Mladic as a Serbian military, military commander and his role in wars in Croatia and Bosnia. The Serbian and Russian articles thus appear to humanize Mladic by describing his entire life, which is uh, uh, which is a very significant, significant characteristic, in effect weakening his symbolic image as a war criminal. The Serbian article, in effect, does not pass Wikipedia's regulations regarding sources, references, and objectivity. Objectivity is clear, but it also lacks to, to cite uh, uh, proper references. But nevertheless, that article for years was that uh, online. It was like that online. Let's show uh, one example of, of this. This is uh, uh, three, three, the same uh, case in three languages. 
how Wikipedia articles in Serbian, English, and Russian give different accounts on the death of Mladic's father in 1945. So this is his uh, uh, early childhood and early fact from his biography. The English article emphasizes the active participation of Mladic's father in World War II as a member of the Yugoslav Partisan movement, as does the Russian article uh, uh, on their side. The Serbian article, like the Russian article, includes the father's first name, but stresses the personal information gives the location of his death, while obfuscating the fact that he died as an active soldier fighting on the side of the communist movement. In the Serbian article, Mladic's father died not as a partisan soldier, but simply as Nejo. So we have this uh, emotional uh, identification and personalization with, uh, with a certain uh, uh, person from, from the past. And the name Nejo is clearly a Serb name, at the hands of nameless Ustash. This personal emphasis indicates that 20th century political narratives are still used as a dominant memory discourse about shared local history. For, exa for example, the Chetnik associations with Mladic elsewhere may have prompted the Wikipedia writers to obfuscate the fact that his father was actually a partisan as well. Further of analysis, I, uh, uh, I uh, also uh, included uh, some uh, significant, uh, as you can see in this slide, significant uh, uh, facts uh, which stem from the uh, statistical but also close reading analysis of, the, of these texts. For instance, uh, uh, we extrapolated the most frequent used terms. But as you can see, this is Yugoslav People's Army, Knin, and Srebrenica, which are quite expect expected. The English and Russian articles emphasize his military career, but in a very different ways. While the English article concentrates on the war in Bosnia and Croatia, and Mladic's ICT in the indictments, the Russian includes the numerous medals and honors awarded Mladic during his, long, during his long career. So this is a conflicting point of view. The Russian, of course, article is following to a certain, uh, let's say, to a certain uh, point of view, uh, Serbian article in this uh, dimension. But I would just like to say that Serbian article does not cite so many honors as a military commander during the socialist Yugoslavia. This is probably because uh, Russians are maybe uh, fond of, of these medals and honors. I don't know, I'm just maybe joking this, in this case. Thus, even the relatively small differences between articles with claims to objective summary allow space for clear political stances and rhetorical manipulations. Omladic, guilty of crimes against humanity in the most recent genocidal, genocidal European war, and the storied military commander Mladic with a long personal history of Serbian suffering. This is related to the Second World War, of course. Some statistics, and this is made uh, using, uh, of course, buoyant tools, uh, 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 mostly uh, using uh, tools for uh, word counts, IP tracers, tracers of IP addresses, and so, so on. You can see here six articles in six languages and uh, three columns, pre-arrest page, post-arrest page, and the page when we were uh, uh, analyzing them. And you can see uh, the difference in numbers of pages in, in, in all three cases. Notice please the difference uh, uh, related to the English and Serbo-Croatian uh, uh, Serbo uh, articles. It is better uh, presented here. I hope you can read. Yes, probably you can. Uh, uh, the blue and the red columns are indicative to show the difference in word counts uh, in uh, pre-arrest page and post-arrest page. When we say post-arrest page, this is the page we traced uh, immediately, the, the oldest page which was immediately after the May the 26, 2030, and we managed to find those pages thanks to internet machine way back, internet archive, sorry, way back machine. Uh, hopefully all of you are familiar with it, which uh, is uh, the biggest, one of the largest uh, harvesters of web, and they uh, archive all the web 
uh, on a certain uh, periodical uh, events. So uh, <coughs> the event of Vladić arrest took attention of Internet Archive and also they uh, harvested Wikipedia articles. So we can uh, show this, this uh, graph or statistical uh, measurements as in this case. As I noticed, as I uh, already told you, in English case and the civil creation case, we have this huge spur of huge uh, number of new words or expansion of uh, both articles due to, of course, uh, uh, much greater attention of not just the media, but the public in general about the Muratko Mladic and the case of his arrest and, of course, subsequent uh, uh, trial in The Hague. Other uh, articles as well got a certain amount of words, but not as many as in those two cases. And uh, interestingly, uh, due two years after the the rest, uh, some of the uh, articles shrink, so they lost certain words. Probably the editors concluded that there are too much information, and in case in English and Serbian articles, uh, they were they were some some parts of these uh, articles were uh, deleted or uh, extrapolated. Okay, another tool is Wikipedia Edit Scraper. Uh, and IP localizer. Actually, these are two, uh, two uh, tools which are quite useful. They, they allow us to uh, search through logs in Wikipedia. Wikipedia is good because every change you do it uh, must be recorded through the name of the uh, person or bot who is make, making the changes, as well as through the IP address. And uh, you, you can see here uh, what happened in the first one hour and 18 minutes with the uh, Wikipedia article about Ratko Mladic in English? So from 10.21, uh, when the first news came, uh, in the next 24 hours, actually, 209 changes, you can see here in this line, 209 changes happened to this article. Uh, when I say changes, it could be a, a change in one word, but it could not be also a deletion of the whole paragraphs. So that kind of changes. And as you can see, it was quite fast, 10.21, 10.23 uh, a.m. Uh, possible capture. So the editors were following the media, and when the news of possible capture emerged, they already do some changes. Then various changes, 10.45, corrections about his biography, various changes after that, uh, 11.03, and uh, please note this 11.39, reverting possible vandalism. So uh, one hour and 18 minutes after the first uh, emergence of the possible arrest uh, uh, or possible capture news was there online somewhere, the vandalism or uh, inappropriate changes of the article happened. And we were capable of uh, following through the IP address where this change or who was the possible author and the uh, IP address of this uh, author who vandalized the article was based in Pančevo in Serbia. So it is north, in city, north of Belgrade, uh, which uh, also shows a certain attitude of, of this uh, person, whoever, whoever he or she is towards the Wikipedia article in English, which is the most important because read globally. Yes. I also would like to show you a certain amount of work done by Marieta Božović on her analysis of Twitter uh, uh, feeds or tweets about uh, uh, arrest of Ratko Mladic. This is what happened uh, in the 24 hours after the, uh, the news uh, went online how the Twitter reacted and uh, she extrapolated uh, from tweets using a certain uh, tool uh, the key, the most frequently used keywords. So this is the cloud of word of clouds or cloud of, cloud of words, uh, which uh, clearly shows that uh, after we exclude this Mladic in HTTP uh, terms, uh, we have biographical information. Uh, we have also the 26th of May as uh, the date of his arrest but also uh, uh, his uh, crimes, as you can see in the top part of this section, Bosnia, Bosnian uh, on various places, but as well as Serbia and the rest. 
So the Twitter responded this way. We also used the uh, analysis of the most uh, mm, the most uh, read online sources in both Serbian and Croatian uh, cases. This is uh, the word frequency related to the uh, event uh, on the B92, a uh, very popular uh, uh, online platform, actually media, but in this case we were interested in their website. As you can see, the most used uh, terms were uh, crime, zločin, hero, criminal, zločinac, uh, genocide. There is also this Dan Mladosti, Youth Day uh, reference, because uh, there was uh, probably a hoax uh, that uh, the Ratko Mladic was arrested on May the 25th, but the government decided to publish it on the second, uh, the following day, because the May the 25th is the birthday of Josip Broz Tito, the lifetime president of Yugoslavia, so they wanted to somehow disconnect the two events, the two pers persons or uh, the, the two discourses. Probably this is the, the just the hoax, the false information, but nevertheless uh, people were also speaking about that. We also followed forum.ach uh, HR, uh, which is one of the most uh, uh, popular forums uh, in the Croatian web, and you can see that uh, their, uh, their uh, uh, interest, at least through the published discussion, was uh, much uh, more focused. The hate, Srebrenica, genocide, and Ante Gotovina. Why, why Ante Gotovina? That's, uh, uh, let's say, the counterpart of Ratko Mladic on Croatian side. Croatian general who was also at that time in The Hague. So both of them were arrested, or actually, I mean, I think that Gotovina uh, went uh, by himself to The Hague. Mladic was arrested, but they were there at the same time, and uh, uh, users of internet in, the, in Croatia were interested in this comparison and about the fate of Ante Gotovina. This is a page, the front page of one of the most popular. Uh, definitely the oldest newspaper in Serbia with uh, still huge prestige regardless of this uh, tabloid era in, in media, Politica. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, this uh, very simple headline is, is shown above these two images, Ratko Mladic Uhapšen, Ratko Mladic Arrested which tops a visual juxtaposition of Mladic in the mid-1990s. This is the uh, left-hand side, so the, the war general with the, this military cap. Uh, with the older gentleman, seemingly frightened men in civil clothing. This is the right-hand side, of course. The effect is complex. On the one hand, Politica seems to humanize the image of the Serbian general by showing his vulnerability and emphasizing the passage of time. On the other, even the repeated key motif of the front, Bill Head, it draws an equation sign between the two photographs. Once more, identification appears crucial. Today's victim is the same person as yesterday's perpetrator. So this was uh, a really nice touch uh, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, um, story about Wikipedia. Uh, I will not speak about a lot about conclusions, uh, but nevertheless, I do hope that uh, uh, it was uh, really uh, evident that this is only the scratch of possible investigation of using sources like Wikipedia for historical analysis, but not just historical. Uh, it's also uh, very important to stress that although uh, most of this new media, as we can call it that way, uh, focus and uh, generates the, the essence from the traditional media, like the newspapers or TV stations. Uh, they became at one point of uh, at time to, to live their own life and to spread the, a certain discourse which wasn't capable, which wasn't visible uh, in uh, traditional media, like the newspapers, because of this, uh, let's say, very dynamic nature of, of the web as itself uh, uh, regarded the media, of course. And of course, I, I didn't tackle this uh, question, but uh, uh, the story about social media, uh, blogs, uh, 
and many other uh, sources uh, weren't included in this uh, case scenario, but nevertheless, they are also uh, a story by their own. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bogdan. And now we turn to the last presenter, Andriy Dostilev. Uh, he'll present the, the title of his uh, talk is Lost Corellian Landscapes how the winter war affected Finnish vernacular photography. And after this, we will have uh, Mikola Machotich, who arrived from Bern, uh, University of Bern, <laughs> not just Bern, and he, <laughs> and he will uh, uh, have his feedback and probably ask questions, and then we, we will have the common discussion. Myself and my practice as not a photographer but an artist working with photography uh, because I usually work with images taken by somebody else, analyzing the way people use photography as a medium in their practice for non artistic purposes and the way traumatic events manifest themselves indirectly in vernacular photography. Uh, I'm well aware that I will be showing some pretty boring family photos here, uh, so I'll try to keep it short. Uh, and I'll start with the bit of a background story. So in November 1939, the Soviet Union starts a war with Finland, aiming to obtain some territories along the border. And by March 1940, it's already clear that Finland is losing the war and they agree to a peace treaty which forces Finland to cede these territories, Karelia and some others as you can see, to the Soviet Union. And uh, though it was not mentioned in the peace treaty, but the evacuation of the Finnish population begins. Uh, almost everybody left, uh, more than 400,000 people moved to the territory that remained Finnish. Uh, they had to do it in a hurry, leaving most of their belongings behind, and uh, the family of Tavi Siltasen, uh, the city councilor of Vipuri, which soon to become Russian Vyborg, uh, is one of those families that moved, leaving behind in their villa at Samova their old family albums along with the other stuff. Uh, but in June 1941 already, Finland joins Germany again in a war with the Soviet Union, aiming to get back the territories they just lost. And for a while they do so, they take back Karelia, and most of the people who previously evacuated start to return. More than half of the evacuees return to Karelia that time. And the Siltasens return as well. Uh, their villa is still intact, which was not always the case, and their old family albums are also intact. In fact, some new photos have appeared there. The Russian family that had lived in this villa during this time started adding their own family photos to these albums while keeping the Finnish photos. So they did not destroy them, they just added new ones. Uh, well, the return of Karelia to Finland didn't last long. In 1944, the Soviet army again entered Karelia this time for long. Uh, so the Finnish population had to evacuate again for the second time. And this time, the Siltasens um, took their photo albums with them, and they also kept the Russian added photos. They did not throw them away. They had labeled them. Uh, 
mentioning these people as unknown Russian guests. Uh, this image is my favorite. Uh, it says uh, the third unknown Russian guest has escaped. <laughs> uh, well, uh, this is one particular uh, quite curious case of uh, what I was looking for when I was invited earlier this year by Sarlakir's museum in Nanta to work on Finnish family archives, uh, looking for subtle traces of trauma caused by the mass resettlement, two of them. Uh, and I wasn't looking for direct images uh, related to trauma, like this one, this shows the second evacuation. I was looking for small changes in the visual codes of family photography that would have not appeared otherwise. Uh, a great source for my research, amongst others, was the archive of Yal Marilankinen, uh, an architect from Viipuri. Uh, this archive is huge, it's like almost uh, 1500 images. And mostly these are images of buildings and interiors which he used for professional purposes, but also he very meticulously documented the daily life of his family in Viipuri. And thanks to that, uh, we, if we can compare the photos he took before the war, <coughs> the photos he took between the two wars when they were exiled to Kuchmalachti, and the photos uh, he took when he and his family returned to Karelia in 1943. Uh, so this is what a typical family photo looked like before the war. Uh, the number of people in portraits was limited to the closest mem family members, his wife and children. There were plenty of outdoor pictures and he was quite relaxed with showing the family wealth, whether it was interior photos or outdoors with a new car, as you can see here. And then they moved to Kuchmalachti, and this is what a family photo looks like there. So now we can see all the family members that were living, that were forced to live in this house where they stayed. So all the portraits from this period are at least four or five people in the image. And as we can see, the wealth has disappeared from the image. Uh, this picture is not badly framed. There are several snapshots of this scene, and they're all more or less the same. He was intentionally trying to show the new interior, the new way of life he had get used to. And the outdoor photos almost disappear from the archive, uh, the only exception being children playing, and it's again four or five children playing outside. And there is a single photo of his car from this period. But then they return to the period, and they immediately revert to the pre-war practices, to the way they took photos before the cases are, well, limited to the upper middle class, upper class. The most common thing, though, that I have discovered, which spans across, well, all the social classes, uh, is the drastic change of attitude towards a certain kind of photos, namely the photos of homes. Uh, if we take a look at the photo album where the photos are glued to the pages so we can see that they initially take some secondary place in the middle of an album between the between a photo of some farm animals and a photo of a neighbor's kid on a bike. But then after the evacuation these photos become the only link with the homeland. And people start to treat them accordingly. Uh, 
they would enlarge them, they would commission drawings made after them, and eventually even paintings painted. Uh, this one here, the picture in the right corner, it's like three by four centimeters in the original, so it's pretty small. And this bigger picture is the photocopy of the drawing after the photo, which was also put in the family album. Uh, at the same time, the mass production started offering cheap photo books with pre-war photos of Karelian landscapes, the nature, the lake, which was targeted at the Karelian refugees, uh, serving as a general generalized link to the landscape, while these family photos, they were also linked to the landscape, but to a very personal, private landscape. Uh, and these mass-marketed photo albums disappeared eventually, but the private photos stayed. I've interviewed people from the second generation of evacuees who were born after the event already, and they still had commissioned paintings from the professional artists after the photo of the house they had never been seen or been to. Uh, and some of these pictures were beginning to disconnect from reality altogether. Uh, one of the evacuees I interviewed again showed me a picture on the wall in her living room. It was a color, watercolor house after the photo and she said that the walls of the original house were not green as they were in the painting because the photo was black and white and the artist could not get the color right but even with the wrong color this painting served as a symbolic link to this house and uh, in the memorial uh, books they started publishing some time ago, quite recently, uh, showing the histories of small communities from Karelia, uh, heavily illustrated with uh, family photos, with portraits, and almost every family in this book has a picture of the house from the very beginning, and there are no other inanimate objects on the picture, so it's only portraits and the picture of the house. And in the 90s, these uh, genre of house photos took an interesting, I would say, twist. Uh, the borders opened and the Karelians, for the first time, got the legal chance to go visit their homeland. And many did. And uh, many of those who did would find only ruins or a burnt out black spot in the ground where the house once stood and still many of those would take a picture there like this one so it still has after all these years traces of trauma even though people don't look especially traumatized <laughs> and I think I will be ending here <laughs> thank you <laughs> This is the shortest presentation yet, uh, and uh, Nicola, uh, you, you can have a seat there, or you can talk from your place, whatever. Yeah, just of all, thank you all three for the fantastic presentations. It was really a huge pleasure to, to listen to, and I really have plenty of questions, so I will try to be relatively brief. I will actually start with uh, Paolo. So, Paolo, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I really love the idea of looking on the humor and also its use both by authoritarian regimes and also by the people who resist authoritarian regimes. My first question here is relates to resistance indeed. Have you actually looked or do you actually have a possibility of looking on the, let's say, oppositional cartoons? Was there any oppositional underground press during the Salazar regime in Portugal? And if there is some, 
did you actually have a chance of comparing the cartoons produced by the opposition and the ones produced by the official newspapers? A related question is related to the interpretation of the, you know, official cartoon uh, practices. I really loved how you interpret those, but my question is, how much is there of propaganda and how much of hidden irony and sarcasm? Because at least in the some cases, for instance, in the case of this football match between Franco and Salazar, from my point of view, I would really read it as pretty much as a sarcastic interpretation. Like, you know, we have two great friends and uh, the countries are so happy that nobody tells anything against them. That's why they play football so much. So I would actually read it as pretty, you know, harsh sarcasm in this sense. And uh, one more thing I wanted to ask um, is more a conceptual one. When we're thinking about the contemporary role of humor, because uh, I'm with my you know, PhD student, for instance, looked on the use of memes during the Venezuelan protests. And then you also have quite a lot of humor used, for instance, to, to criticize the Venezuelan regime, but also to, to the opposition by the supporters of the Venezuelan regime. When you're thinking about the contemporary use of the humor in this context, do you actually see the continuation between how it was used, due, let's say, during the Salazar regime? Or is it a totally different way of using humor? Because for me, it actually looks like very different. I would say the digital space here actually makes a lot of changes. But I would really love to hear your opinion on this one. Bogdan, thanks a lot too. I really very much pleased to always see everything related to the digital memory. Wikipedia is really one of my favorite platforms. I have several more conceptual le level questions. And my first question is, why Wikipedia versions are so different? You know, I know it's a very complex question. I spent like years working on this question. But I really would love to hear, to hear what do you see? Why in the case of for Red Comlavich, when we have the same event, when we have the same platform, when we basically have the same community practices, which tell us, okay, we have to provide a neutral point of view we have to really adhere to the certain standards of the quality. Why is it so different? Even despite, you know, all the all this attempts that we try to put into getting to the consensus. And my second question is raised also to this one. Like, would you say that the possibility of actually comparing the rations, which is so nice about Wikipedia, and indeed it really provides this possibility in hundreds of languages, would you say it is a good thing which is really more of a monument of our utility of uh, trying to reach to the, you know, more cosmopolitan, more pluralistic version of history. Because personally, every time I'm reading different versions of Wikipedia, I'm getting very disappointed. It basically shows us that we really have zero chances of arriving into some version of cosmopolitan history. We always want to quarrel in those different versions and never able to reach consensus. What do you think about this? And finally, uh, Andre. Fantastic talk. I really love watching the old photos, even while those photos are really sad. Uh, I would say that photography is not necessarily my strongest side, so I would uh, ask two probably very basic questions. My first question is, why houses? Because, you know, there are so many different objects that uh, actually initiate our nostalgic thinking, or our traumatic thinking. Why would you say houses are so important in this case? And uh, what, how, could you, how could you also interpret, you know, this dramatic change that I also find so interesting of this person who actually showed his wealth and showed his house and showed, you know, really good life of his family before uh, moving from Karelia. And then why he again starts to do it when moving back to Karelia? Do you have any idea? Because it's really such a huge change for me. And uh, my... You, Last, I would say, question slash comment. I've actually thought about connecting it uh, to the phenomenology of space uh, by Gaston Bachelard, because I immediately thought about the phenomenology as one of the interesting points of interpreting actually this relationship to the houses and the role of the house in the memory. And we definitely can talk more about the phenomenology after this. Uh, talk. Thank you very much. Well, I start, since the first question was for me, 
uh, opposition cartoons. What opposition? There are no opposition. Mm -hmm. Of course there are opposition. So the Communist Party was illegalized, but they, 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 they it simply did not, did not vanish. They, the Communists in Portugal uh, organized themselves in clandestine, how do you say, clandestine, you understand? And they published a newspaper, uh, which is still published today. Of course, it, it, it passes on, I mean, uh, under the door. It, it was not sell openly on the streets. Yeah, but that newspaper actually don't publish any satirical uh, critiques on the regime. It's a political weapon of the opposition against the regime, but did not explore the satirical approach. Uh, saying that, uh, there are no... Well, the Communist Party and this particular newspaper were the most and mainly the, the better uh, organization in the opposition of the authoritarian regime until 1974, okay? Uh, the, the Republicans that were in power until 1926, they have several parties with several newspapers. They also were all illegalized in 1926, and they kind of vanish. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't uh, leave any type of traces in, uh, on, on the society. So the communists know. The communists stay on the field, they organize themselves as an underground resistance, and they, uh, they have the, 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 that newspaper that I, that I mentioned. But there are no opposition cartoons whatsoever uh, in, in, in the sense that you, that you ask. That leads to the second question. The, car the cartoons that I showed, and the opposition between propaganda and sarcastic approaches. I mean, there were that, that, those, cartoon, those cartoons and caricatures, and there is a technical difference between caricature cartoon and editorial cartoon, which is a different type of cartoon. Um, those cartoons are the opposition cartoons to the regime. Because, for instance, if you remember the blackboard with Salazar as a professor and the student written, I pay, you pay, we pay, everybody pay. So, if you look at it in the point of view of the teacher, I mean, you are in a serious environment with the teacher playing his role, but if you are seeing in the point of view of the, of the, of the student, who is actually writing the verb to pay, and he, he is the only one who has to pay, that's a, an implicit and a direct critique to the, to the regime. So the, the newspapers that were allowed to be published during this period, they used this type of instruments to criticize uh, the regime uh, in, in this not sometimes very obvious, but sometimes not so obvious way. This is related to something that I was actually going to ask before. Uh, there was this uh, censorship regime, very tight censorship uh, regime in Portugal until 1974. Every single drawing, every single article of the newspaper that is going to be published tomorrow, today, has to be reviewed by a censorship commission. And after the censorship commission sees, it, pay, it, it marks as a review, and tomorrow the article can be published, or the draw can be published as well. Well, the problem is the censorship officers, they were very, very, very badly poor educated. That means that sometimes they don't realize and don't understand the critique that they have before his eyes. So they allow to publish some of them, some of this material, and this material actually implies a direct or an implicit critique to the regime. So there is, this is funny to understand and to observe the, the, this dialogue, this kind of a game between the censorship officials and the, the, the artists uh, and the drawers and the newspapers and the journalists that 
cannot they cannot say directly, but they say they still say uh, in the indirect way of answering to the to the to the critics about digital humor. If I understand well, actually, this is the final chapter of my book related to to, to, to the Portuguese case. It, there is this very interesting phenomenon that happens in Portugal. After the democratic revolution of 1974, uh, all the parties were legalized again. The Communist Party uh, was legalized again. Uh, we have elections for parliament. Uh, we have a new constitution in 1976. So uh, censorship disappeared. Uh, we lived in a play in a democratic society. What happened is the graphic humor almost disappeared uh, from the late 70s uh, on the 80s onward until today. Today we still have not a single newspaper like these ones that I've shown. And now there is no reason for that. I mean, we have democracy, there is no censorship, we still have very good, very brilliant, I, I should say, cartoonists and caricaturists, but there, has no, there is no space for a, a, a graphic humor newspaper. And that happens in Portugal after the democracy came, which is very interesting, interesting to analyze and to try to understand why is it so. I mean, during the dictator, with censorship, with very close censorship, we still have this type of new, of, of, of dialogue between the artists and the public, which is a very long tradition in Portugal, came back from the mid 19th century. We actually have one of the best artists of all uh, of all Europe, I think, in, of all Western uh, Western civilization uh, in the 19th century. A guy that, unfortunately, it is not very well known abroad, but it, but is is brilliant. I mean, if you compare it to Dumbier, if you compare it. To the, to the best British artists of this period. This guy is even better than them. <laughs> but he founded a lot of newspapers, he runs, uh, he published thousands of, news, uh, of drawings uh, for more than 30 years. So this is to say that we have a long and rich tradition of this type of critique, this type of satirical uh, humor. But after the democracy came, it disappeared, almost like a miracle that happens. Uh, why is it so? Well, you answer it in a part, in a bit, saying that today there is different forms of communication with the public. Uh, we have social media, we have di several ways of, in, in the digital era to communicate and to publish and to express ourselves, and there's not so much room for uh, traditional media. Even traditional media in Portugal, I guess everywhere, but in Portugal, is in a, is in a, is in not a, in a very good shape. So, uh, satirical press is also not in a very good shape. I'm not sure if I answer correctly, but that's what mm -hmm. I think about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nicola, for your questions. Uh, the first one was about the, the differences. Why, why is it so different? Well, it's hard to say, but uh, I, would, I would try to, to put several, several observations about the nature of Wikipedia. First of all, 10 years ago, Wikipedia was much smaller as a, as a project, looking at, as a whole project. And uh, we have this emergence of new articles in uh, new languages, connection in between the languages, of course, references, etc. Uh, so many people are involved. Uh, random contributors, regular contributors, more ed editors, super editors, moderators, then people employed in Wikimedia, etc. So in this uh, very complex system, uh, we are talking about thousands of uh, individuals. So it is very hard, of course, to to control it, and uh, Wikimedia, as the owner of everything, is not keen to control, to put control, because from the very beginning it is uh, considered and uh, 
promote it as a democratic project, which uh, asks for contributors that will give time and knowledge, of course. And I still uh, consider Wikipedia a great source for arts, culture, ground sciences, uh, sports, maybe, etc. But for the historical questions, I'm quite cautious because 90 plus percent of Wikipedia articles are the best articles for in all Wiki, in, in all encyclopedias. They are better than all the articles in uh, Britannica, definitely. But these several or couple percents uh, problematic, which really took attention. Yes, and you are right. Right, there are huge differences because we are uh, involved and we are researching problematic issues from the past, of course in this case and probably in your cases. And that's why we have this problem because all the cleavages, all the conflicts transpond to this new realm of digital technology and of the web. And of course, various uh, passions emerge over there as well as uh, uh, negative uh, actions like uh, uh, false information, false references, unexisted authors which are quoted, which is quite evident, as well as fake news. Uh, so mentioning fake news, we cannot also forget that uh, maybe not all of these contributors are individuals. Maybe these are fake uh, profiles uh, regulated or controlled from a certain center. So that's very, very possible. I wouldn't say it is a common uh, common thing, but uh, in today's world, when we are speaking about more and more control from the governments trying to regulate the web and the information on the web, I, I cannot say how Wikipedia, Wikipedia will be or could be immune to this trend. Uh, there is also one more uh, aspect uh, which is maybe also on the same level of importance, that's the net, that's not nationalization of Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia started uh, primarily as an English part of, 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 uh, of the project, then uh, major languages, world languages were added, and only after that we got this uh, really uh, huge number of, let's call them smaller lang languages, like Serbian, which has less than 15 million speakers throughout the world. And uh, uh, reading, up, uh, reading logs of uh, the editors, their talks, their uh, discussion, their accusations, uh, answers, questions, etc., there is a very, very, uh, I would say, high proliferation of understanding that this is ours, meaning this is the Serbian part of the web. So don't put your remarks because you're not Serbian or that's not Serbian point of view. We don't like it. We don't like you. Go away. <laughs> that's really, that's how it, 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 it sounds funny, but you can read it. Probably in other, this so-called nationalized Wikipedia, parts of Wikipedia, could we, could, we can read uh, similar stuff. I was interested in, in the Serbian, of course, during my research. But this is also the case for this couple of problematic, percents of, of problematic articles. In most other cases, really 90 plus percent, articles are decent, proper, with uh, real references, and with proper language, without the hate speech, etc., etc. Uh, the second question was about the, the cosmopol cosmopolitanism, right, of the history and the, pro the problem of how to, to approach the past uh, from this point of view. Well, I would say that we are speaking here about the big data issue, and uh, big data itself is not something uh, uh, originally related to the humanities or the research in the history, but nevertheless, uh, we are under influence of this big data. And uh, in, in the case of Wikipedia, we can say that it is really uh, the matter of big data. If we want to analyze the whole of Wikipedia, we would really need a, a data center with supercomputers. Uh, even for our small project, I would say, in this case, we have problems of processing information. So there was al always the tendency to, to uh, minimize the, the amount of input 
to be able to process the output and to understand, to interpret. And I would say that uh, if we are not possible, we are not able to deal with the data uh, in a proper way, regardless if it is one researcher or thousands working on the same project, we should be very cautious about entering the, the research process, at least I'll say in history. Because I'm not sure that we, uh, we should uh, uh, provide output as the raw, raw numbers, or like, let's say raw paragraphs, without our interpretation. The basic, uh, the basic job of all historians. Now I'm speaking as a historian, but I hope others are also uh, recognizing the, 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 this, this uh, point of view. So uh, this is, uh, uh, in my understanding, the problem with big data. We should be able to always discuss uh, what the computers are saying to us. Without, without this uh, element, uh, I would uh, abstain from uh, entering any kind of research because I don't see the point of just producing numbers and numbers of uh, raw data. Uh, I think that some other disciplines probably are more interested in it. We should concentrate on, a, on, a, on a interpretation of uh, historical facts. And uh, to conclude, uh, I uh, really shared your notion about the problem of this cosmopolitanism of uh, approaches or cosmopolitanism of topics we, we are uh, confronted with, particularly in digital history, if I may say, say it like that, because uh, of this, as I, as I already explained. I hope you, you can understand mm -hmm. what, what was my meaning. Thank you. Okay, the first question was why houses hold such sentimental value. And uh, I think it's connected to the differences of urban and rural way of living. Uh, whenever I'm talking about houses and nostalgia, uh, we are talking about either farmhouses in villages or in smaller number of cases, villas outside of the city. Uh, and I have never encountered a single case of nostalgia towards someone's flat in a multi-family house in the city. And well, for people living at a farmhouse in a village, their whole life was based around the house. So yeah, it was sort of a family member in a way, which they lost. So they naturally develop a sort of nostalgia towards it. Uh, for the urban population, uh, the landmarks that create nostalgic links are either the Ladoga Lake as such or some prominent buildings in Vivoli like the train station and it's not as, as, as sentimental as the nostalgia towards the family house. Uh, and the second question about the drastic change in the wealth display, uh, the best way to answer it probably would be, I don't know. <laughs> I can only guess, and my guess is as good as anybody's. Uh, I suppose they saw this place, and well, most of the evacuees saw their places, residence, after the evacuation as temporary. And I expect it to be the general well, way of thinking of the Finnish population. We can see that only 15 months after the evacuation, the government used the first opportunity to enter the war and to try to take back the land. And that's probably what they thought of their place as residence. And that's why they didn't care to decorate it, to make it a place, a permanent place of living. Okay, we have a few more minutes for uh, questions. Uh, so. Can I have it? Oh. Uh, I have a question for Bogdan. Um, because um, as you were presenting those Viking wars, uh, I, I would say that they simply reflect those bigger ideological uh, divides or bigger, bigger historical disputes. 
Do you think that they are simply those bitter wars? They are simply reflection of those bigger disputes and divides, or they have maybe their own dynamics or something is um, specific about them? We collect a few questions. Okay, uh, I have one question to Bogdan and one to Andre. So, uh, about this uh, Wikipedia wars, and I think you were discussing during your talk that there are so many cases from Eastern Europe, for example, all this Russian-Ukrainian rewriting of Wikipedia about, you know, some uh, writers or painters from imperial times, these de debates, who were these people, Russian-Ukrainian or both, or something like that, and if you open Wikipedia of any Ukrainians, about any Ukrainian city, each language version would be different, and in case of Eastern Europe, uh, very often also this, uh, Battles of content also include visual parts. So uh, Wikimedia and visual part of these uh, articles are really different because with visual part, authors very often trying to say something that they are not putting into wor uh, words or something that could be cut by editors. So how is the uh, situation with this visu visual as way of debates in your cases? And the uh, question to Andri, so it's continuation of this question why houses, because during your uh, talk I was thinking about other cases when nostalgic tourists, uh, uh, tourist Poles or Jews today are coming to Ukraine and looking for some routes, or when uh, uh, Crimean Tatars in 80s and 90s came back to Crimea, they also uh, referred a lot in also in visual, uh, in, in, in family photos to some uh, material evidences of their presence in, in this uh, space. But with these other groups, I could see really um, um, difference between personal photos as you shown in case uh, with photo of house or, or place of house and like some, something like group uh, memory or a group uh, 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 or evidence of group presence when people are taking pictures with churches, with uh, buildings of community life or something like that. So uh, are you looking for this other part that goes beyond uh, family or individual experience that like proves uh, presentance of uh, 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 these people as a community, not as individuals in the, in the territories? Are you question uh, I would also have a question following up uh, the issue of wiki wars so this is the question to Bogdan as well uh, related to the uh, to the presentation that you uh, gave very uh, thank you very much for this and I was curious whether it's only about uh, wiki war wiki wars and discussions and uh, confrontations uh, in different language versions of Wikipedia reflecting different, uh, I don't know, states, nations, but whether it's also about wiki wars within uh, one specific uh, language version, whether it's uh, also an issue about, uh, I don't know, discussions in uh, different social, political groups within the country, within the society, because I was listening, uh, a few months ago, I was listening to quite similar presentation about wiki wars in Ukrainian context, uh, given by a uh, uh, head of Wikimedia uh, Ukraine, and he mentioned that uh, even within Ukrainian Wikipedia there were a lot of discussions about specific cases. I cannot remember the, any specific case at the moment, but he was also mentioned that sometimes discussion within, within even Ukraine, Ukrainian Wikipedia is uh, uh, taking place, and there are uh, specific forums or groups uh, uh, for a uh, I don't know, uh, several uh, dozens pages long uh, where uh, editors of Wikipedia discuss within even Ukrainian uh, uh, fraction of, of Wikipedia discuss specific uh, article and they have different opinions how to present a very specific historical uh, notion or uh, historical event or a specific topic. So whether it's uh, only about uh, I don't know, confrontations between um, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia and so on, or there are also uh, specific uh, confrontations and discussions within Serbian society in Wikipedia, in Serbian version of Wikipedia. So, if you have a few minutes, please give us all answers. Okay. Should I start? Yeah. 
Thank you for your question. So I would, uh, we will try to be uh, uh, brief and specific. Uh, the question about uh, whether uh, Wikipedia articles are just reflection of those disputes or do they have their own dynamics of life? If I'm, if I'm not uh, properly re reinterpreting the question. Well, in, at the end of my uh, presentation, I mentioned something about this that uh, uh, my or our conclusion is that uh, we are witnessing uh, uh, that uh, in this case uh, they are all grounded on a certain uh, uh, on a certain disputes uh, which are of course in, in real life the disputes from the past uh, but they are ga gaining more this <coughs> own life and own dynamics through these frequent changes or through the uh, intention, be, being uh, uh, willing or unwilling intention to make changes, to make uh, proper or fake news, etc. So, to the certain uh, 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 to the certain level, I would say that uh, we are witnessing that it is becoming the, the the organism by its own. It has its own life. It's it has own uh, life. It has its own discussion within itself. So, uh, a certain discourse is building around around this case. Uh, <coughs> regarding the question about visual in the articles, uh, yes, it is very, uh, Wikipedia is very prone to this uh, because uh, the selection of uh, visual elements like images will of course reflect the, the overall tone of the article. We will avoid, in case of Ratko Mladic, uh, uh, the images of uh, uh, dead bodies or mass graves in Srebrenica, if you want to to minimize this part of his biography, or contrary, on the other hand, we will, uh, as in the case of Wikipedia in English language, we will put as the first uh, image and the first information the user will see on this page that he is a trial war criminal. So that's the most mo important fact we want to emphasize. Uh, or of course, uh, doing contrary if we don't want to do it. So, uh, using uh, images or using a certain uh, tables with uh, graphical representation of uh, factual information, etc., to back up uh, uh, our facts is something which uh, Wikipedia is not immune, because uh, the authors, the editors of, of Wikipedia are the people who are making this decision. Regarding uh, the, the comment about or uh, the question about the, the, is this the issue within the local sphere of languages or the, let's say, regional disputes, etc. I would say it is not, of course. Uh, when uh, uh, things happen, things happen with Crimea, uh, articles in the Serbian part of Wikipedia needed to change. So actually it started already with, uh, with the clashes in the Eastern part of Ukraine. St uh, those uh, those uh, articles dealing with the history of Ukraine, history of Russia, Russian Empire, the history of the region of the Northern Sea as well, changed changed to a certain amount, more or less, to better reflect the position, the new position. You know, Serbian government supports uh, uh, Russian pretensions, and uh, uh, it is obviously clear. It is very very obvious uh, also in those articles. Uh, about uh, this region of the world. I don't know if I uh, answered all the questions. Uh, are you satisfied? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking about nostalgia towards communities, it has to do a lot with the way Finnish government handled the issues related to the evacuation. Namely, they were well, doing their best to preserve the original communities. So people from the same village were usually resettled to the same place. So they kept the communal ties and there was no need for nostalgia towards the community as such. And if we speak about nostalgia towards some communal landmark, then with the exception of Vipuri city that I mentioned before and the lake. Uh, well, there were churches you could develop nostalgia towards and, well, nothing else. So, yeah, 
when you people I interview warm up when they show me the pictures of the community in front of the church but it was just general nostalgia at work in the old life didn't have to do anything specific with the place or church building 